We've been looking at this topic as we've come through Galatians, the fifth chapter, starting in verse 19. We looked at the uh, passage that deals with the deeds of the flesh and uh, that, that are made manifest. And we looked at that long list. And last week we started the passage in the 22nd chapter, or excuse me, 22nd verse that deals with the, um, with the fruit of the Spirit. And in the fruit of the Spirit last week, we dealt with the fruit that is part of the inner man. That of love, joy, and peace. And we noted as we studied throughout those points, it is the Christian, as individuals who have the presence of God, the presence of the Spirit in our lives, that we will be producing these things, and they are part of our inner man. Love is something that comes from within. Joy and peace are characteristics that come from within. But Christianity is not a narcissistic religion. I think because of our carnality, because of our willingness as people to serve ourselves, oftentimes... We stop there with Christianity. Don't get me wrong, there are important issues of Christianity that serve you. In fact, tonight, we're going to look at the grace of God getting man through. Or how do I get through this? And we are going to talk about some of the benefits or blessings that God makes available in my life. And many of us, particularly early in our Christian walk, are drawn to Christ because of what he can offer. And what greater offer could there be than for the forgiveness of sins? What greater offer could there be than to be in fellowship with our Heavenly Father? To not get, to not be given what we deserve but what is so much greater. But this morning, we move beyond that to see the Spirit in action towards others. And we're going to look at three characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit today that are all in action or action towards others. It's important to have our faith based on, to have our belief system based on the truths of Scripture. There's scarce much in life that's more important than that. But my beliefs will never change the world. Your beliefs will never change the individual next to you or that you contact in this life if that is all they are. And the fruit of the Spirit is beyond that. The fruit of the Spirit is evident in the Christian's life because it impacts the world. Jesus Christ has changed the world. Jesus Christ uses his people to change the world. And as Christians, I believe we ought to strive that we ought to be ever mindful of the idea of the responsibility that I have to impact my fellow mankind. What will I do to change the lives of of those around me. Number one, I believe I must strive to have long suffering in my life. Throughout 
the works of the flesh, we looked at so many, at least four translations for each and every one of those words because those words were so complex that different translations really bring out the richness. And this is kind of one of those situations that King James translates this word long-suffering. Some of our more modern translations, ESV included, translate patience here. That the fruit of the Spirit here is patience. But there's a difference, isn't there? And there's what I believe a significant difference. What we are talking about, what Scripture is talking about, is the idea of long-suffering. It means being willing to suffer long. Some parents understand that. more than 18 years of suffering right <laughs> it doesn't end at 18 years I know that not because my children are over 18 but because I inflict suffering <laughs> after that age the idea that we're talking about here is that of suffering long of being willing to put up with injustice and to continue to put up with injustice what in the world does a long nose have to do with long suffering? The literal translation of the word that we get long suffering or patience in this case literally means in the Hebrew, if we go into the Old Testament, long nose. We talked about anger and we talked when we went through the deeds of the flesh, how it changes our appearance, how it changes our breathing, how it changes everything that we do. And that very imagery is being drawn on in the contrast here with long suffering because the Israelite, the Jews, understood or believed at a very early time in their history that when an individual becomes angry, their breathing becomes shorter and it becomes choppy. And the idea of a long nose really is getting at the idea of long, slow inhales and exhales. What a pictorial language that they had. And so the idea here, it goes beyond, Emily, me just not flipping out and yelling and screaming at you. It's more than that. It has to do with my heart and my motives that I don't even want to do that. I'm sometimes proud of myself. When I was younger, at much more high frequency of the time when I became angry, I would act on it. I would say a lot more things that I regret. I acted a lot more hot-headed than what I currently do. Say, oh, I've gained long-suffering. Now I need to wait a little longer for that. <laughs> because this has to do with controlling every aspect, even our emotions, as we encounter one another in life. Why is that important? Before we look at Colossians 1, 10 and 11. I think this is why it's important. You see, well, I'm frustrated with Amanda. Or if she's frustrated with me, she normally has more just cause. I may experience or I may exhibit restraint. And I may not say mean things. Or harsh things. But what do I do to keep quiet? Bite my tongue. <laughs> Turn around and I walk out of the room. She still knows. I still conveyed the message, didn't I? Christians, we ought to be careful the message we convey. We ought to be careful of what we tell one another. My children get pouty. I, Mike gets pouty occasionally. But I tell my children 
You've seen it, huh? Have you, Anna? Yeah, that's why she's giggling. I tell myself the same thing I tell my children. You don't have the right to make anyone else feel bad. Just because I'm having a bad day, and I may need help. I may need your help to get me through difficulties, and I may need your comfort, and that's not what I'm talking about. But what I am talking about is my hamburger came out cold, Kevin. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to stomp around Louise and flop down next to her, and, and, and I'm going to let her and everyone else know my hamburger was cold when I wanted a warm hamburger. We're conveying messages on a regular basis. We convey a lot of messages to individuals. They're in our presence, in our worship services in our lives and as we encounter them throughout our daily walks. We ought to be careful what those messages are. Paul said to the Colossian congregations in verse 10 and 11 that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being faithful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering here's the catcher <laughs> with joyfulness you see that Pam you don't just have to put up with Ernie <laughs> you have to be joyful in your long suffering of Ernie <laughs> she says wow <laughs> right that's the fruit of the Spirit. That is the fruit that will change the world. That is the life in Mike Smith that will impact other people. That's the characteristic in your life that will help those around you be drawn closer to Christ. You see, to be truly long-suffering we must build upon love remember we noted last week that the fruit of the Spirit is singular the fruit of the Spirit is love for me to be long-suffering I must be building upon love you see, because whether I'm long-suffering, whether I'm patient towards you, has to do with how I look at you. You ever been in the presence of someone that their mere breathing irritates you? <laughs> Minda, have you ever? <laughs> right? When our, our view of someone changes, Everything about them changes for us. And if I love you, when I have a genuine concern for you, it's much easier to be patient towards you. Long-suffering starts with the thought process. Long before we are wrong. You see, if I tell myself, I, just, I have to put up with it when I'm wronged, and I just have to take it, I'm going to fail quite often, and do fail quite more often than I should. But when I prepare by loving my fellow mankind, by loving you, by loving those who are around me, it changes how I am affected when I'm wrong. I have some questions for you. Do you care for people? Or are you calloused? Do other people's hardships prick your heart and bother you? Do you desire for those around you to be all they can be and to be the best they possibly can be? Do we assume the worst about 
others? Or do you assume the worst about others? Brenda, your hair looks beautiful this morning. <laughs> if, if Brenda assumes the worst about Mike, she's going to tell Mike on the way home, if she assumes the worst about this Mike, she's going to tell that Mike on the way home, I know what he really meant when he said that. <laughs> it wasn't a compliment. <laughs> he knows I forgot to... I hope you didn't forget to comb your hair so hard. It certainly doesn't look that way, Brenda. But he knows I forgot to, to comb my hair. I'm in, we're self-conscious, right, about ourselves because we assume this individual couldn't possibly be being kind. We assign negative motives if we assume the worst about people. Do we care for people? Do we assume the worst about them? Here's a big one in America. This country was built on rights to never be wronged, right? Well, not quite. Close to that, right? Freedom. And freedom at its heart means if you tax my tea, I'm going to throw it into the bay and find a new government to tax me. I won't put up with a wrong tax, right? Do we demand not to be wrong? Or are we focused on our rights? When we are, it affects how long-suffering we are towards our fellow mankind. What right do they have to park in my parking spot? What right do they have to be in front of me in line? What right do they have as we drove the Pittsburgh a couple of times yesterday, Chris, a couple of times we were cut off. What gives them the right to cut me off? What makes them so important? What makes me so important that I can't bear to touch the brakes for a few seconds? Do I demand not to be wronged? Do I recognize my own shortcomings? See, all of these things affect how I view other people, how I act towards other people, and how much I am bothered by their shortcomings in their lives. True long-suffering starts long before anything has went wrong. But the trait of long-suffering that we're talking about today goes beyond even being wronged. It touches every aspect of our lives. It touches how we respond with the problems in our lives. I used a traffic illustration just moments ago. <laughs> I used traffic illustrations because people can be so impatient and demonstrate the lack of long suffering when we are surrounded by big hunks of steel and feel quite protected. I can't wait until this traffic's out of my way. Why do I have to sit here? Hebrews, the sixth chapter in verse 12, says that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit, inherit the promises. The Hebrew writer is urging the Christians to live as those who live their lives with faith and patience to get to their promises. Troy and Chris were sitting in the back seat last week, last night, as we went down to the to the uh, the wrestling, and we were looking for a parking seat. And those two felt that it was their duty to try my patience. <laughs> so they started. What? Where are you going? No, no, don't go right. That, where? Where are we? Why? Are, we're gonna miss the whole wrestling. Dad, Dad was insistent we be there four hours now. Two and a half hours early, something like that. We had plenty of time. 
didn't you see a parking place back there? Right? They were just, they were poking a little bit, exercising my patience, which is, is good to have happen. But the kind of long suffering that we're talking about is that we get there with joyfulness. We get there through all the challenges without bitterness in our hearts. Uh, sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. But that is exhibiting faith and patience as we strive to inherit the promise that is given to us. Being kind, being considerate, being careful towards those who are around us. And joyfully enduring the challenges of this life. How do we do that? I hope to elaborate on that idea tonight as God gets us through by his grace. Secondly, I will not only exhibit long suffering in my life to impact or to change the world, but I will exhibit gentleness and kindness or kindness. This is a trait that's not looked at well today, is it? Who is it we respect? Those who are strong enough to take what they need or want. Those who are bold enough to stand up for their rights, to demand what is rightfully theirs. But the fruit of the Spirit is one of kindness or gentleness. It's interesting, the world tells us that we will get the most by grabbing and by forcing our way in to life. But scripture tells us a soft answer turns away wrath. You ever have anyone call you infuriated? Upset? Wronged in their eyes in some way? Maybe at you, likely at you if they're calling you, or at me and they're telling you about it. How do you respond? A soft answer turns away wrath. It's amazing. If you've never done it, I encourage you to try it. When someone is infuriated, breathing fire, their nose is so short <laughs> that they can barely breathe. Say a kind, gentle word to them and watch what happens. A harsh word stirs up anger. Boy, it's so easy to do, isn't it? I shared at the beginning of the Bible study, I sat next to individuals last night and an individual in front of us was being incredibly obnoxious. How easy it would be the, to poke the bear. <laughs> it's hard to back away from wrath. It's hard to bring peace into the world. But the fruit of the Spirit does exactly that through long-suffering gentleness and the last one we'll look at tonight, or this morning, is that of goodness. You see, the will of Almighty, the will of God in our lives, goes beyond simply not doing wrong. You see, that's the very point of this passage. That he gave all those ideas, all those things that we're to avoid in our lives. And now he goes into the positives. Here's what you are to have in your life. And one of those things is goodness. I've heard so many times goodness defined as the opposite of unrighteousness. What's goodness? Well, that's not, right? That's not at all what goodness is. Goodness has nothing to do with not doing and everything to do with doing. You see, goodness is about doing something. 
In John the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 15, one of my favorite passages is Jesus Christ talking about the vine and the, the branches abiding in him. But early in that chapter, he talks about the idea that if we do not bear fruit, we will be cut off from the vine and burnt. When the vineyard, when the vine dresser, I mean to say, goes through and he prunes his trees, he doesn't cut off the fruit bearing branches. He doesn't cut off that which is providing fruit. He cuts that off, that what off which is doing nothing. In Christian walk, we are to be filled with good works. In fact, James said to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. That means that my life is to be filled with good deeds. I think to elaborate upon that, in the second chapter, he said, What does it profit, brethren? Profit. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not good works, can faith save him? I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I go to the church on Sunday. I go to church on Wednesday. I study my Bible. Well, there's an action, huh? What does it profit? And have not works. Can faith save him? 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful of the body, what doth it profit? Allow me to put those in my words, if you would. How many of you are going to be hungry here in just a few minutes? How many of you are hungry now? <laughs> How many of you tuned out for the last 10 minutes there and thinking about lunch? <laughs> you got a couple of hands? Well, we, we have honesty <laughs> amongst a <the> couple, <laughs> right? You're going to do something about it. There's no amount of thought processes that are going to fix that issue, is there? It's simply action. It's going to fix it. And that's what James is saying. See, realizing you're hungry is important. When you don't realize you're hungry, that becomes problematic. But unless you go and get your food, you're not going to have the problem solved. And such is the case with our fellow mankind. Seeing is hunger, understanding is hunger, being aware of his hunger is a start. Doing something about it is a must. Even so, faith, if it hath not worked, 17 is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and if I have, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you my faith by my works. If we are in the presence of God, if God is present in our lives, if the Spirit is in our life it will bear fruit and that fruit will not be hidden it will be like a city on a hill a light that cannot be hid it will show in our lives through action and I assure you I can assure you because God assures you it will change the world James, in that first chapter, the very last verse, he said, pure, or in other words, true religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. What's your religion about? I started by saying, we are not a narcissistic religion. So why are you here? To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and keep himself unspotted from the world. James is symbolizing here with a very specific example.
to take care of those around us. We can't demonstrate our love for the soul of mankind unless we, un- we demonstrate our love for mankind. And no amount of food, no amount of shelter, no amount of physical assistance in this life will ever benefit in the long run mankind unless we share with he and she the very saving truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we have a life that remains unspotted, that through Christ is unspotted from the world. And may we have a life that bears fruit of the Spirit, that draws men to our Heavenly Father, that they might be saved by His mercy and His grace. If you've not started that walk this morning, I encourage you, I invite you to take advantage of the invitation given to you, this opportunity by your Heavenly Father, to respond in faith, confessing Jesus Christ before men, being willing to repent of your sins and be immersed for the remission of your sins, living then a life in total submission and servitude towards the greatest master one could ever imagine, Jesus Christ. If you're subject to that gospel call, then please come forward as together we stand and sing.